Hi everybody, my name is Sabina and welcome to my channel, Left Handed Alchemy. I am the artist and the visionary behind this channel. I am finally back making a video. It's been like two years since I've made a tutorial video. The first one that I did right here, if you want to watch it, go ahead. It received about 10,000 more views than I ever imagined that it would. It was my first video I ever posted to YouTube. I struck fame <laughs> and it made me freeze in my boots and it took me two years to make another video. But we've done a lot of work on ourselves in those two years and we're back. We're back and ready to share our knowledge with the world. So this week we will be making a turquoise and silver ring right here is a picture. Um, super simple design with a little added flair. I'll be doing a step-by-step -step on how I make this ring. Let's get into the video. The first step is to solder your bezel. This holds the stone in place in the final design. And I did forget to show you the steps of actually making the bezel. So I'll do that in a video later, but here it is wrapped around the stone. The next step is to cut out the back plate. So I found a piece of 22 gauge sterling silver sheet and a scribe, and I'm marking where I will be cutting the piece from the sheet of silver. Once I have the silver marked, I use a coping saw with a 3 aught saw blade to hand pierce out the back plate from the rest of the sheet of silver. <laughs> I really like to sand things as I go. So the next step is to take a piece of 220 grit sandpaper and sand the major scratches out of the front and back of the back plate that you just cut out. I use that same piece of sandpaper to also sand the bottom of the bezel so that it lays flush against the back plate and it offers a cleaner solder joint on the finished product. Next step is to solder the bezel onto the back plate. So I start by dipping both pieces of silver in a solution of denatured alcohol and boric acid. This mixture keeps the piece clean by degreasing the whole thing and allowing for a more clean solder joint. And it also coats the piece with a coating of boric acid, which helps prevent fire scale, which is that weird purple stuff that's like deep in your silver when you get to the final stages of the cleaning process. It just keeps the piece clean overall. And I really like keeping the piece clean from the beginning so that I have less cleanup at the end. I apply a liquid batter's flux and then I'm going to stick feed my solder to this piece. So I basically just heat the piece evenly until I see the visual cue telling me that the piece is hot enough and I drop the solder in there and then you can see it flows. The next step is to work on the details around the stone. So for this ring I am doing two layers of detail. One is a silver wire border and then the other layer is the granule ball detail that you'll see. I'm using 16 gauge silver wire for the border. I'm using a Sharpie to mark where the wire overlaps so that I know where to cut with my flush cutters. I will then file both sides of that wire to make sure that it's nice and flat and so that it sits really well. And then I will use my hands and some needle nose pliers to wiggle that wire back and forth to get it nice and flush. I'm soldering this ring just like I did the bezel, so just a little bit of flux, and then I will stick feed this. <laughs> it's really messy. I get this piece way too hot. So this is a good example of do as I say, not as I do, and also an example of if you overheat your piece a little bit or if it gets a little weird, it's not going to ruin your entire piece. Now that I've gotten that all soldered and cleaned in the pickle, I will make sure that the ring actually fits around my stone setting. And as you can see, it fits pretty good. So apparently I didn't get the clip of me soldering that ring onto the back plate, but I did get the clips of me making the little granules for the next component of the details. 
I cut small, even sized pieces of fine silver scrap bezel and I melt them into little balls. I think that fine silver works a little bit better than sterling silver because there's something about the sterling silver, it's definitely the copper content that makes it end up pitted. If you know, you know, you just have to experiment and see what I mean. When you melt a sterling silver ball while it cools, it kind of contracts and it creates these pits. So that's just why I use fine silver. The next step is to solder the actual granules onto the back plate. So I do the boric acid concoction and then my batter's flux and I heat it up really slowly so that the balls don't snap, crackle, and pop all over the place. For this solder application, I am using chip soldering for really fine details. I think stick soldering can get really messy, so I cut little pieces of solder and I'm using a soldering pick to actually apply them when the metal gets hot enough. It just, there's a lot less of a mess that one tiny little pick or a little pallion of a solder is going to create that entire stick. So that's just what I recommend, but do what's best for you. I slowly apply each little piece of solder to each side of the stone setting, making sure that each ball is attached to the final piece. And this is just gonna take some time and some practice and some patience. And alas, the solder has been applied and we are ready for the next step. Now that all the details are added to the stone setting, I will use that same 3 aught saw blade and the coping saw as before to pierce out the excess silver around the piece. <laughs> step is filing all of the excess silver and making sure that everything is just nice and clean the way you like it. I use a couple of different files. This one's kind of rough so it takes off a lot of material at once and then I switch over to finer files to just make sure that everything is nice and clean as I go making sure that all the silver is exactly shaped the way that I want it to be. <laughs> Then I go in with my flex shaft on a snap-on mandrel with a snap-on sanding disc. It is the coarse grit. It's the nylon ones. I don't know. You can find them on Rio Grande. And I just clean up all of the file marks and then I clean up the edges that are kind of sharp and just begin the finishing process of the actual stone setting. I like to do a lot of the finishing before I solder on the ring shank because it's kind of hard to actually sand some of the scratches that will be underneath the ring shank while it is on there. So I think that it's best to just do a lot of the scratch removal before you solder on other major components that will get in the way of being able to actually clean up that space. Here I do the sanding, I go in with a radial bristle disc. These are normally made by 3M, but this is a knockoff that I found on Amazon and it's actually really great. If I can find it, I'll link it down below. I just do this to soften the marks that the sanding disc made and just make sure that I'm actually removing the scratches and not just moving the scratches around. And I think that this just is like a pre-finishing step that shows me kind of what the end result will look like. And I really like doing a lot of the finishing work before the piece is actually finished. So when the piece is actually finished, there's not as much work to be done. I ended up deciding to do a couple of stamp marks on the side of the border that I made. I thought it would give it a little extra razzle-dazzle, and I think it did. The next step is to make the ring shank. This is a piece of half-round 12-gauge wire that I will turn into the ring shank. I wanted to make a split ring shank, so what I do is I take that piece of wire and I cut about a centimeter down the center of each end of that piece of wire.
my parallel pliers to open up the end of each side of the ring shank to give it that Y split shank look that I'm looking for. And then once I have it about the position that I want it and everything straightened out quite right the way I want it, I will go in with that snap on sanding disc again and clean up the kind of funky edge that sand or sawing that split can sometimes leave. It just, you know, another example of finishing as you go. I'm using a ring shank bending pair of pliers to get the shape started before I put it on my ring mandrel, but if you don't have one of these, it's not really necessary. You can just get it started right on the ring mandrel and it will be just fine. I'll pop it on my ring mandrel and then I will use a nylon hammer to shape it to the right size. I wanted to make a size 8 so I just formed it around and around until it matched up with size 8. In order to make the ring shank sit flat on the stone setting that we just made, I will file the ends so that there's a flat point on each one of those four little pieces of silver. Now it's time for the final solder. What I didn't show you is me applying four little pieces of solder to each one of those little end tips. Didn't have the camera set up quite right. <laughs> so here I am soldering it and you'll be able to see that solder flow in just a second. There it goes. Oh yeah. Now it's time to finish this baby. After I've inspected the piece to make sure it's how I want it and I know that I'm done soldering, I go in with various finishing bits to get all of the excess solder off, to get all the sharp edges off, to get any scratches out. Just anything that doesn't want to be in the final product of this piece, now's your chance to get it out. The first bit that I used was a silica like grinding wheel. Um, the second one is that same snap-on sanding disc, and then the third and fourth ones will be different grits of those radial bristle discs that I had talked about before. Each step doing different things. This one, I'm removing sharp edges, removing excess solder, removing any big scratches on the ring shank, and then with the bristle discs, that's kind of where I go in and give it like a general overall finish before I apply patina and do a final hard polish. <laughs> Oh yeah, I forgot about this sanding attachment. This is just a piece of sandpaper attached to a slotted mandrel. It's basically just like a long strip of sandpaper that I wrap around the mandrel and tape on there. And it's really good for cleaning up scratches on the inside of a ring shank. Now it's time for the patina. I use a gel liver of sulfur in boiling water to 
apply my patina just pour it in there stir it around with some copper tweezers and then drop your clean piece of metal into that and it will turn black very fast Once I've patinaed my piece to my liking and cleaned off all the excess liver of sulfur, it is time to polish. I use this Luxie Polishing Compound. It's hands down my favorite of all of the brands that I've ever used, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But first, I use this small buffing wheel to polish the inside of my ring because I will use my large polishing wheel to polish the outside, and I don't think it's really possible to polish the inside of a ring shank on that wheel. I feel like it's gonna take my arm off if I even tried, so I'm not going to. I use the Luxie Polishing Compound for multiple reasons. One, it uses vegetable oil instead of animal fat to kind of bind it together, and there's a lot less silica and just crap in the actual polishing compound. Like, Red Rouge and White Diamond are poison. They are horrible for your lungs. It causes silicosis. It's a bad time. It's a good product as far as its functionality and the fact that it polishes a piece really well, but do you really want to lose your life over a polishing compound? Not me. So I use this. It's a lot easier on your lungs. And another added bonus is if you've ever used polishing compound, you know that there's going to be black residue all over that piece when you're done. It will be polished, but the polishing compound sticks to it because the piece heats up and it just sticks to it. It's just part of the process. So if this is your first time polishing, just know it's part of the process. And if you're a seasoned veteran, you know it's part of the process. And with these older brands of polishing compound, you have to use harsh chemicals like acetone to get the residue off. And I just thought that was such a pain in the butt because sometimes acetone can ruin your stones and it's just overall not a great time. And with this Luxie polishing compound, you can use hot water and soap and a toothbrush to get it all off and it works like every time and it's a lot it's just a lot better for you the environment your systems all of it and so that is why I recommend Luxie polishing compounds <laughs> there's actually like a million different um varieties that you can get for different metals different grits all of it all of the above and they even have a sample pack that you can buy and it's super affordable and honestly those little sample bars last a really long time so if you are interested in cleaning up your studio and having a more environmentally and bodily friendly polishing compound I'm going to recommend Luxie and I'm not sponsored. I spend my real hard earned dollars on this compound and they don't even know I exist, but here I am repping their brand because I love the product that they provide. So here I am polishing the front of the actual ring with my polishing wheel. Keep two hands on that bitch at all times. Excuse my language, but if you know, you know when that piece sometimes you know you're just you're just polishing your mind in your own business and if you're not paying complete attention and making sure that you're gripping the piece exactly right that thing will fly and it will it will catch on the wheel and it will fly across the room and it is terrifying never before have i seen my life flash before my eyes and when a ring or a piece gets caught in the polishing lathe and flies back at me just be careful the piece is all polished to where I like it we are going to go and set the stone I personally use a knockoff GRS ball vise to set my stones you don't need something like this they have like handheld vices that you can use for setting rings that's what I recommend if you have a small budget um, I was tired of doing that, so I bought this knockoff GRS ball vise, but you don't need to do that if you are just a beginner. I start by opening up the bezel to make sure that the stone fits, and I pop that little baby stone in there, and I get to sit in. 
I use a brass bezel pusher, and you'll see her appear here in a second to push the bezel down. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. I just kind of start on one side and work my way around. Haven't had a problem with that yet. If you're working with a pointy stone, you'll want to step. You'll want to set the points first, but. This is an oval stone, so no corners to worry about. Um, go around it a couple times. Make sure that you get all the edges down real nice. While I was setting the stone, I noticed there were a couple of chips missing in the ring, which is really disappointing. And when I say ring, I mean stone. Um, I got this stone from directly from the people who cut it. Didn't see the chips when I was picking the stone out for the project. I don't know why I'm finding it important to tell you guys about this right now, but <sighs> quality matters a lot to me. So when I see something that's not super high quality, it makes me disappointed, but it's okay because I think overall the ring actually turned out really well. I really like it. And the last step for me is I clean up the bezel. Sometimes during the stone setting process, that bezel pusher will mar the ends of the bezel, the edge of the bezel really. And so I use this kind of medium grit silicone um, carbide, silicone carbide grinding wheel to just polish out any scratches and just make sure that it's looking nice and fresh and shiny because this is really the last step. Maybe I'll go ahead and hit it with the polishing lathe one more time to give that stone a little extra razzle dazzle, but I did not film that for you guys, so... As far as you're concerned, this is the last step. Look at how beautiful it is. And here, here, look at her in all of her glory. Let her bask. She's so beautiful. I love pyrite and turquoise. Something about that combination just melts my little heart. That's so good. So I'm going to stop talking now so you can enjoy this. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was clear. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer all of the reasonable questions within a reasonable amount of time. I just wanna help people in the pursuit of becoming silversmiths. I know that formal education is very expensive. And I learned how to do a lot of silversmithing at home. That's how I got my start, was literally using one of those blue butane torches in my parents' garage. And I did take classes at in college. I think that it's really cool how a lot of smiths are self-taught. I do want to, bring like the knowledge that I learned in institutional education to everybody. I just don't really agree with the elitism of university and college. I don't think everybody needs to go to college. I think that we can do a lot of self-teaching and do a lot of community teaching. I do encourage you to take classes in person if you have an art center nearby. Just having community around it, even if it's like you learned all the skills from people on the internet, but you go and use the tools in an art center. That's pretty awesome. Community is so important. You don't need to spend tens of thousands of dollars at a university to learn these skills. And I encourage you not to do that, actually. If you're interested in supporting this channel, you can purchase this ring on my website. You can purchase all of the things that I have made on my website. The link will be down in the description. If you like this video, like it, subscribe. I'm hoping to make more videos like this more consistently. <laughs> it will not be two years before I make another video. I already even have next week's video recorded, so we're good. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.